I want to invite you to take your Bible today and turn to Isaiah chapter 43, but I also want you to uh, either take down some notes or be prepared to move with me through various texts of Scripture. And I want today to focus our attention on the importance of staying in the Word of God. Now, that's not really the message today, but it is a sub-message or maybe even a uh, major message to stay in the Word of God. There is a lot of uncertainty in our time. There is a lot of unanswered questions. Seems like just when we're having a question answered, several more questions arise. But what I've come to find in these 58 years, specifically the last 41, is that God's Word is rich unto life. God's Word is filled with the answers to our questions. God's Word uh, is unable to be exhausted in the truth that it shares with us. And while we are living in troubled and difficult days, God's Word is certain and sure and can encourage us and teach us and guide us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as how to live. In fact, I believe the more you and I pay attention to the times, and the more we read the Scripture that we will find that God's unthwartable plan is being worked out beautifully even in our day. I want to read to you, first of all, from the 119th Psalm. Uh, And as I do that today, I, I want to thank God for the blessing of those who have invested in my life and in your lives over the years those people who have opened the Word of God and rightly divided it for us, and those who may have taught us to study the Scripture, whether it is a Sunday school teacher in your childhood or in your teenage years or your young adult years. Uh, For me, it would have been my pastor when I was 16 years of age and through my college season. Uh, I remember even as I pastored for the first time for three years in college, every week I would listen to my pastor's message from the previous week. It was very important to me while sharing God's Word to be receiving God's Word. And so today, let's praise God for His His Word, the Scripture, the Old Testament and the New Testament, 66 books that make up our Bible. Uh, We praise God uh, for them, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. And what's very interesting today is you will note that Isaiah's prophecy, uh, which has been often described as kind of being the Bible uh, in one book, uh, it is 66 chapters long. Uh, It is divided into two sections, chapters 1 through 39 and chapters 40 through 66. Uh, That's right, 39 and 27, just like the breakdown of the Bible. Psalm 119 says this, how can a young man keep his way pure? Let me add to that, how can an old man, how can a young woman, an old woman, a small child, and an elderly adult keep their way pure? By living according to your word, O Lord, I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I will recount all the laws that have come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes. As one rejoices in great riches, I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees and I will not neglect your word. I want to challenge you to read that again today at some time and read the whole of the 119th Psalm. Listen, God's word is given to us as a gift to guide us, to counsel us, to lead us, to teach us. God's word is just what we need in this uncertain time. Aren't you tired of the rhetoric of the politicians? Aren't you sick to nausea, ad nauseum of those on the left and on the right who are filling us with the opinions of man? Would we not desire for someone to rise up in our day with the integrity of God's man and wisdom and speak to us truth even at the political level? 
Beloved, it's happened before. If you look at the book of uh, the Old Testament books, there were 40 kings in Israel, the north and the southern kingdoms. Only eight of them did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And even greater still, only a few of them truly sought to have the heart of God in their lives. I believe we need to pray earnestly for God to raise up those kind of men and women in our nation. In Isaiah's time, there was prosperity in the southern kingdom. Great prosperity. The economy was flourishing. People were living lives filled with pleasure. They were going to and fro, enjoying the blessing of all that they had material. But during that time, I want you to understand, in the 8th century, even the southern kingdom of Judah was living in great idolatry. God's people were worshiping him, supposedly, but they were worshiping this God or that God. They were gathering together and mixing up uh, different things as they uh, created their own concoction of faith, if you will, and God sends forth his prophets. Now, be reminded, God called his people to be one. He called his people to be one nation, a nation of priests. Don't you think that when people came across the seas to these United States of America, to this land, that their heart's desire was to be one nation, and yes, one nation under God? Let's not be mistaken today. We are a divided nation. No matter who is in the White House, this nation is split down the middle. If you do the percentages, nobody has a mandate. Nobody has strong support. In fact, often people vote for one candidate because they did not want to vote for the other. And so we are faced today uh, with a divided nation. Remember, the nation of Israel proper was divided during the time of Isaiah. Why were they divided? Because of rebellion against God, because of self-centered narcissism. The people exhibited a desire to please themselves. Politicians and priests alike wanted to have power. They wanted people's attention. They wanted everything for themselves. Jeroboam, you remember, came uh, to reign because of Rehoboam's uh, self-centered narcissism and his desire to outdo his father. And so the whole nation was impacted by ungodly leaders. Pay attention to that. No matter what the rhetoric is, our lives speak the truth. We need to pay very close attention to that. And so the nation was split. God loved his people. Had they obeyed him and walked with him, both of those nations, though divided, would have been blessed by the hand of God. But you remember, first of all, the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom, succumbed uh, to being overthrown by Assyria in 722 B.C., in the 8th century. That was during the time of Isaiah's preaching ministry and prophetic ministry. But he primarily spoke to the southern kingdom. But what we have in Isaiah's gospel, as it has been called, is the first 39 chapters deal with God's coming judgment upon the nation of Judah because of their disobedience and rebellion. Now, let me remind you today that Isaiah was the most righteous man of his day, but his message was not popular. No Judean wanted to hear that they were not living lives pleasing to God. After all, times were prosperous. People were enjoying wonderful uh, experiences with their family and friends. They could get together for the feast of the Lord and throw in a little of that religion, throw in a little of that religion, and go down to the valley of Gehenna and sacrifice a child to Moloch while having just gone up before the Lord to offer a burnt offering, supposedly. This nation was divided. Doesn't that sound like us today? There is no mandate for Joe Biden. 
There is no mandate for Kamala Harris. There was no mandate for Donald Trump. We are divided. And yes, like you, I believe that one platform is better than the other, but oftentimes the platforms are merely used uh, to uh, woo us to it, voting for them. In fact, I believe political parties often use people and people groups as mere pawns in their plan. Let me tell you today, God's Word is filled with examples that are much like the days in which we are living, and we need to ask God for wisdom to understand our times. At some point in the near future, after prayerfully considering it and continuing to study the Scripture, I may address some of what I see in these days as it relates to God's Word and His plan but I'm not ready to do that yet. But I want to mention to you today that you and I need to be mindful that the first 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah are written about the coming judgment of God upon a nation that he created, formed, and fashioned for his glory, for his purposes. It was always God's will that his people would honor him and that they would be a light to the nations. Aren't we supposed to be a light to the nations? And somehow right now, I think the nations are laughing at us. They're mocking us. And please do not be deceived. It's not because of one party or the other. It's because of both and all. The people of God need to surrender to the Holy Spirit of God, not to the political plans of those over us today. Yes, God can use political leaders, religious leaders, but remember God used Isaiah to speak of coming judgment on a nation that was experiencing maybe the best economic season they'd ever experienced. But then also we see in the second part of Isaiah's prophecy in the last 27 chapters, we see words of comfort and words of hope that emphasize to us today God's grace and mercy to them then. Let me read to you just a portion of Isaiah, and you've got to understand the context of the whole to be able to interpret and understand each and every passage. But the book is written, and let's look at chapter 1, first of all, uh, together today. The vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah, the son of Amoz, saw during the reigns of Uzziah. Uzziah was a good king for the most part until pride got a hold of him at the end. Jotham, Ahaz, Ahaz was a wicked king, more wicked than any other. But his son, Hezekiah, sought to do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And if you go back to Kings and Chronicles, his story is a blessing. And let us pray for leadership like that in our nation in the coming years. But he reigned during these times over the kings of Judah. Verse 2, hear, O heavens, listen, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have reared up children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. He's talking about God's people, Judah. The ox knows his master, the donkey his owner's manger. But Israel does not know, my people do not understand. Ah, sinful nation, a people that are loaded with guilt, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel, and they have turned their backs on Him. Why should you be beaten anymore? Why should you, do you persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured. Your heart is afflicted. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness among you, only wounds and welts and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with oil. Your country is desolate. Your cities have been burned with fire. Your fields are being stripped by foreigners right before you, laid waste as when overthrown by strangers." The daughter of Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard. 
like a hut in a field of melons, like a city under siege. Unless the Lord Almighty had left some survivors, we would have become like Sodom. We would have become like Gomorrah. You see, God's left a remnant, though we're due judgment and, and we're due being wiped off the face of the earth, whether it be Israel or even people today. God is gracious and merciful, and he leaves a remnant. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Now, y'all keep in mind, he's not talking to Sodom and Gomorrah. He's talking to the rulers of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom of God's people. Listen to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Listen now about their worship. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have had more than enough of your burnt offerings. Burnt offerings, remember, were to symbolize devoted lives to the Lord, consecrated lives of devotion to the Lord. He said, I've had more than enough of your burnt offerings, of your rams and the fat of fattened animals. God said, I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing your meaningless offerings to me. Your incense is detestable to me. Your new moons, your Sabbaths, your convocations, I cannot bear your evil assemblies. Your new moon festivals and your appointed feast, my soul despises. Y'all, he's talking about times that are meant for the worship of him have become nauseating to him. I have bec they've become a burden to me, and I'm weary of them. When you spread out your hands to me in prayer, I'll hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, eloquently he's saying, I will not listen to you. Why? Because your hands are full of blood. Remember, they were still worshiping Moloch in the valley of Gehenna. Moloch was worshiped by child sacrifice giving over of a child to this false god of Moloch. We've studied that before. Is our nation not doing that through the practice of abortion today? Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. They are red like crimson, but they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best from the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. See how the faithful city, Jerusalem, has become a harlot? She once was full of justice. Righteousness used to dwell in her, but now murderers dwell in her. Your silver has become dross. Your choice wine is diluted with water. Your rulers are rebels, companions of thieves. They all love bribes and they chase after gifts. They do not defend the cause of the fatherless. The widow's case does not become before them. Therefore, the Lord, the Almighty, the Mighty One of Israel declares, Ah, I will get relief from my foes and avenge myself on my enemies. I will turn my hand against you. This is the Lord speaking. I will thoroughly purge away your dross and remove all of your impurities. I will restore your judges as in the days of old, your counselors as in the beginning. Afterward, you will be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion will be redeemed with justice, her penitent ones with righteousness. You see, a word of hope is beginning to shine through the darkness. But rebels and sinners will both be broken. And those who forsake the Lord will perish. 
You will be ashamed because of the sacred oaks in which you have delighted. You'll be disgraced because of the gardens that you have chosen. You will be like a, an oak with fading leaves, like a garden without water. The mighty man will become tender and his work will be a spark. Both will burn together with no one to quench the fire. You see, God is bringing about a word of judgment, but he keeps telling them, if you will repent, if you will return, if you will reason with me, there is hope, but judgment is coming. And you read on about the mountain of the Lord. Chapter 2, this is what Isaiah the son of Amoz saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established. As chief among the mountains, it will be raised above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many people will come and say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many people. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, O house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord." Now, listen, for the sake of time, I can't keep reading, but I want to challenge you to read. Look at chapter 3 and verse 1. See now, the Lord, the Lord Almighty is about to take from Jerusalem and Judah. He's about to remove from Jerusalem and Judah both supply and support. All supplies of food and all supplies of water, the hero and the warrior, the judge and the prophet, the soothsayer and the elder, the captain of 50 and the men of rank, the counselor, the skilled craftsman, and clever enchanter. He's going to remove them. Listen to this. This is what Isaiah was sent to the people to declare. God is about to bring judgment upon his people and his nation. Be ready and be prepared. Turn and repent. Over and over through the scripture, God calls humankind to repent before coming judgment. God is always offering us a way of escape. But know this, Judah nor Israel northern kingdom of Israel repented. In 722, during the time of Isaiah, the northern kingdom fell to the Assyrians and they were stripped away from the land. The region of the Galilee, so beautiful. The region of the valley of Armageddon, so rich. All of those people stripped away, taken to Assyria. And only the poorest left. And Isaiah continued to preach and continued to preach and call the people of Judah, the southern kingdom, to repentance, to restoration, to renewal in the Lord. And God was giving them an opportunity. But the, the fact is, history records well for us. In 586, in the 6th century, long after Isaiah perished and died, God's word came true. The prophecies of Isaiah fulfilled as God's people in the southern kingdom were carried off by the Babylonians because of rebellion and disobedience. God warned them, gave them a word through his prophets. And y'all, let me remind you, if God would allow this to happen for his chosen people, Israel, who are we as people of this country and this nation to not think that God would not allow our strength and might to be stripped from us? Who are we to think that God would not allow us to become the people who are mocked by the nations of the earth? We need spiritual awakening in our country. We need spiritual awakening in our state. We need spiritual awakening in our homes and in our hearts. God has given to us his word. And so all through the first chapters, the first 39 chapters of Isaiah, God declares to his people judgment is coming. But then through the last 27 chapters, while he still speaks of difficult days, he speaks 
of hope and mercy and grace. And by the way, chapter 2 that I just read to you, when it talks about in the last days and the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established, that's a word of prophecy yet to be fulfilled. That's talking about the millennial reign of Jesus Christ when he comes back to the earth and reigns in Jerusalem for a thousand years. And you know what? It's going to happen. As certain as the sun rose this morning, there will be a day where chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, will be fulfilled and Jesus will reign over all nations in Jerusalem. Thanks be to God. But until then, we need to pay attention. Look in chapter 43 now, and this is where I want to share with you today. We live in uncertain times. We live in days worthy of judgment. And I want to say to you again today, folks, please do not give your allegiance to the Republican Party or to the Democrat Party. Give your allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ and to his kingdom and his kingdom alone. When the Republicans do what is pleasing in the eyes of God, join with them. When Democrats do what is pleasing in the eyes of God, join with them. Listen, let's be very careful. Immigration is a great point. All this talk about stripping children away from their parents. One political party wants to use that to sway our hearts emotionally, to buy into what they're saying. And another party will use this or that. Seek the wisdom of God. And so in chapter 43, God is speaking again. Now remember, there's a transition in chapter 40. And in, there are four servant songs in the book of Isaiah. Four servant songs. Chapter 42, chapter 49, chapter 50, and then the last part of 52 and 53. The servant songs are speaking of Jesus Christ who is coming to do a work. And you need to know that. It's not talking about the nation of Israel. It's talking about God's true servant, Israel, Jesus, who is governed by God. Where Israel, the nation, has failed, just like the church has failed in so many ways. The Lord's servant would not fail, but would accomplish the will of God. And so we read of Jesus. But here's what I want to offer you today in a time of great fear. But you have to understand there's a lot going on in the world and we're living lives in so many ways unpleasing to God. If the church of Jesus Christ would rise up and live righteously before the world, if we would live holy lives distinctly different and set apart, if we would shine like stars in the universe, if we would hold forth the word of life, God would work in our lives. And yes, according to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, God would even heal our land. But we have a part to play in it. But listen, we're living in uncertain times right now, and I want to just speak to your fears and to your anxieties. Now listen to me. I'm speaking today to those people that want to surrender themselves to Jesus. Not governments and nations, not policies and platforms, but you want to surrender your life to Jesus to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are living in uncertain times. If you had asked me two years ago, would I ever have any sense of fear whatsoever officiating at a funeral or a wedding, I would have thought you were nuts. Would it ever cause me anxiety to, to officiate at a funeral or a wedding? Would I have any concern about the setting or going to it and accomplishing what I was supposed to do? Absolutely not. But today, because of the coronavirus, our minds are in, in, in overdrive. We're thinking and we're pondering. I had a service yesterday for a lady I've known probably 55 years. Her family said, Pastor... Basically, please don't hug us. Don't get near us. Nobody's going to get close to anyone. We don't want to get the coronavirus. On Friday, I was asked by our new sheriff, Reginald Scandrett, to participate in a memorial service at the sheriff's department for Mike DeLay, who passed away having had COVID and then went and had a cardiac arrest uh, incident that took his life. 
And as I stood surrounded by our uh, sheriff's department personnel, men and women, as I stood there among the administrative team of the sheriff's department and the family before me, I knew that what had happened is I'd been invited to bring words of encouragement to people who are suffering in this time. And so I use this text. But what I want to tell you today is you and I do not need to fear. Though we feel fearful, though we feel anxious, though we feel uncertain, though there's some confusion in our midst, and on the list goes, we don't have all of our questions answered, and it may be some time before they are, if they ever are. We've been asked to do things like social distance, wear a mask, wash our hands, and on the list goes. And as everyone is trying to do their best for the good of others, there is still maybe in the heart of some listening to me today troubles. Your heart is anxious. You're stirred up. You're feeling uncertain and unsure. Here's what I want to remind you today. Those of you that are truly seeking the Lord and surrendering to his will, I think chapter 43 speaks a word to us about how we can have peace in troubled times. Isaiah's time was troubled. Remember, all of that prosperity was stripped away from the nation of Judah in a moment's time when they were overthrown by Babylon because of their disobedience and their rebellion and their idolatry. But look at chapter 43 with me for just a few minutes. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, that means to create something out of nothing, to bring about something that did not exist before. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel. Listen, God created the nation of Israel. He chose Abram of Ur of the Chaldees, and then God created a people group, the Jewish people. And then God formed them. He worked with them and he formed them and fashioned them for his purposes. And that ultimately was to bring glory to him. So read again there in chapter 43, verse 1. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel. Remember, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Jacob means deceiver, heel grabber. Israel means governed by God. This man that was deceitful, and deceiving in his living was now to be a man governed by God and his descendants, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were formed to be God's holy people in the world. Listen to this message that he spoke to them and speaks to us. Fear not. Fear not. Over 365 times in the Bible, we hear fear not. Doesn't that calm you today to hear God say, fear not? He said it to Joshua, do not be afraid. The angel said it to the shepherds, to Mary, to Joseph. Fear not. When God says to you and to me, fear not, our spirit should calm and we should begin to experience a peace. If a doctor walks into the room with a diagnosis and he says to you, fear not, don't be afraid, it's all going to be okay, that brings relief. But he says, fear not. What are the reasons that we have not to fear? I think they're listed for us very clearly here. In a time so troubled as ours, in a time so troubled as Isaiah's day, what is it that helps us to not fear? How is it that we can fear not? What are the reasons that we're able not to fear? Well, several. First of all, we can fear not and experience peace because the Lord has saved us. Look what it says right there in verse 1. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. Y'all, we don't have to fear today because the Lord has saved us. Now, when he says, I've redeemed you, he redeemed the Israelites from Egypt. He paid a price. Remember the Passover lamb and the blood was applied? God brought them out. 
not to leave them in the wilderness as we've considered so many times, but God brought them out of Egypt to bring them into his presence and ultimately the promised land. So y'all, God said to them, fear not for I have saved you. And I want you to know today, just like God brought them out of Egypt, you and I can rest in peace today because the Lord has saved us greater still by the cross of Jesus Christ and the spotless, unblemished blood that flowed through his veins. Why? So that we would be redeemed. We would be saved, not for a moment and not just through bad experiences, but for all eternity. I was talking with Herb Britt this week and pray for Herb. He's very sick, most likely colon cancer that may have gone to other areas of his body. They're trying to determine what's going on. But while Herb is concerned, Herb's heart is filled with peace. How and why? Because Herb knows that he's blood-bought, that he's saved. And even if this disease appears to end his life, Herb knows that he wins because he is redeemed and therefore he does not need to fear. The reality is for all of us, we don't know, do we? We don't know if we're next to receive, to, to get the coronavirus. We don't know how our bodies will respond to it. We can think about it all day long, but we don't know. That's one thing we've seen. This disease, this virus is impacting people so differently. A strong man perishes and an un a, a unhealthy man lives. An aged man does fine and a young man suffers and struggles greatly. We don't know, but here's what we do know. No matter even if the coronavirus takes our last breath from us, we do not need to fear. Why? Because God has saved us. You say, that just sounds so spiritual, Pastor. It is. Listen, how can we go through life but to know that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, not of our works, lest we would boast, but because of his glorious work on the cross. Y'all, that in itself tells us, don't be afraid. God wins. We win in him when we're yielded to him. We are saved and therefore we have peace. Secondly, we do not need to fear because God has named us. He has summoned us. Look at it. I have summoned you by, by name. You are mine. I have summoned you by name. Donald Trump and Joe Biden, they don't know your name, but God, the God of eternity, who formed and fashioned all things, knows you by name. And you not only have a name, but you're named by him if you're in Jesus Christ. 1 John chapter 3 says this, How great is the love that the Father has lavished on us, those of us that are in Christ, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we will be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. And I could read on. Listen, we are the children of God. He has named us by Christ. We're not orphans any longer. We're not orphans any longer. We're the sons and the daughters of God. Listen, folks, that ought to bring us peace. When Prince William and Prince Harry were born, they would never want for anything materially in their life because they were children of the prince who was the son of the queen. Never will they want for anything but their souls have no satisfaction apart from Jesus, no different than us. But y'all, we are named by Christ in salvation as the children of God. Rest in that today. 
rest in that today. No longer are you and I orphans, but we're the sons and the daughters of God, and that should bring us peace. Thirdly, we should be able to have peace in our hearts rather than fear because God is near us as we considered at Christmas. Look at verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. He's saying, I will be near you. I will hold on to you. When you pass through the, through the waters, I will be with you. I will be near to you. That's what Emmanuel means, God with us. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Folks, we can have peace because God is near to us. He's not far removed in, in some place and land we know not of, but God is close to us. In fact, indwells us in the Holy Spirit. We can have peace also because God will sustain us. Look at verse uh, 2. B, and when you pass through, the, by the way, let me remind you of something. He says, when you go through the waters, when you cross over the rivers, when you go through the fire, troubled times are going to come in our lives. We're not immune to them. Know that every one of us will face heartache and hurt. It's common to man, but we don't have to fear. Why? because God will sustain us. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you, for I will sustain you. God's grace sustains us, the New Testament says. When our weaknesses manifest, his strength is manifest all the more. When you pass through the rivers, they'll not sweep over you. I'm going to sustain you. And then look at this. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. We can have peace with God because he protects us. You know, my first inclination when I read this is to have thought, he's talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Maybe you thought about that. It's the first thing that comes to my mind. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. And I thought, oh, he's talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But there's a problem with that. What's the problem? They didn't come around for 200 more years. This was a word of prophecy. How did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego get in that fiery furnace without bowing their knee to Nebuchadnezzar? It's because of the prophecy of Isaiah and his Jewish men. They knew the word of God. They knew the prophets. And so as they had heard Isaiah, he said to them by the authority of God, you will walk through the fire and you will not be burned you will not be set ablaze, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. May I just say to you today that I bet there was some kind of conversation in the fire, fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. One of those boys was quoting that scripture, that prophecy from Isaiah, as they marched into that furnace, and it was so hot that the men that put them in died. You remember? But the king looked and he said, wait a minute, were there not three of them? I'm seeing four. That's because the Lord, their God, their Savior was standing right there. And who knows but that the Lord himself didn't say to them, I told you, fellas, and my word is as certain and sure as the sun that rose this morning and sets tonight. You can trust me for the rest of your days. And you know what? That's how those men made it through because they had trusted in God's protection. Yes, we all feel uncertain today, unless you're some kind of super spiritual giant that's never known fear. Don't be so confused if you think that's you. God's promised to protect us, and we do not need to fear. Remember, one of my favorite verses is Genesis 15:1. Abraham, you don't need to fear, for I am your shield, and I am your very great reward. Beloved, those poor Capitol policemen, two Wednesdays ago this week, they had something to fear. Their shields were not strong enough, but our shield is strong enough. It's the Lord God himself. The flames will not set you ablaze, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. 
And then he says this, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I have formed and made. You and I need to be mindful of something today. God is our peace. You remember Isaiah told him in that little bitty verse in chapter 9, we shall call him wonderful, counselor, the everlasting father, and the prince of peace. The prince of peace. He gives to us peace. Now, what do we need to do to experience that peace? We need to feed on the Word of God. Nick read it in Psalm 1. I read it in Psalm 119. You can read it in uh, Colossians chapter two or 3 and chapter 4. Let the Word of Christ dwell richly in you. God's Word is flawless. It is perfect in every point. Feed on God's Word. Ezekiel said it tastes as sweet as honey in my mouth. Be saturated with the Word of God. Find wisdom in God's Word. If you read Proverbs chapter 3, it talks about he who finds wisdom is blessed. Y'all, wisdom uh, is different than just having knowledge. Wisdom is having knowledge that knows how to apply itself. So spiritual wisdom is understanding God's will and how to apply it in your life. We need to look at things through God's eyes and let his word teach us and lead us and direct us. Feed on his word, find wisdom, which is to know his will and how to apply it, and we need to follow God's will for our lives. His general will to be saved, to be loving, to be gracious, to be merciful, to be kind, to be generous— but we need to follow God's specific will for our lives also. And that means the way that we are bent. Just like in a moment, people will sing and play behind me. God has bent and gifted them to do that, whereas God has given me a voice and a mind to be able to share and to deliver his word. We're to fulfill God's will for our lives, presenting our lives as living sacrifice is holy and pleasing to God. And that tells us we have to learn the will of God. How do we do it? By feasting on the word of God, by learning it. We need to live the will of God, not just talking about it. Listen, talking about God's will is of no use to anyone and is of no glory to God. You can go through every Bible study known to man. You can go to every seminar, read every book, but until you apply God's word and will in your life, you are of no use to the kingdom of God. We need to live the will of God as we shine like stars in the universe. And you know what? Something else, folks, and I want to tell you this. We need to love the will of God. God's will is perfect. And to love God's will is to love God and to obey God's will is to honor him and to love him. And so listen, we do live in uncertain and troubled times. And like you, I've about had enough of these times. I'm ready to move on. But we can't change what's taking place. Only the timetable of God will accomplish that. But what we can do right now is to live in peace, not in fear. Because we serve Jesus Christ. And if you don't serve Christ, the invitation is yours. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they also shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. What do you have to do? Confess your sins. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Ask him to save you, forgive you of your sins, and to give you the gift of eternal life And then you will begin to walk in obedience to him as you surrender to his will. And that will is a blessing to follow as you seek to be God's person. Let's pray together.